Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the GLOBE webinar series on the future of global governance. I am Carrie Otterburn of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, and I will be your host and moderator. Today, we are joined by Adam Dean, who will be discussing his new book, Opening Up by Cracking Down, Labor Repression and Trade Liberalization in Democratic Developing Countries, published in October of this year by Cambridge University Press. Adam is Assistant Professor of Political Science at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. His research focuses on the political economy of international trade, labor politics, American political development, and the socioeconomic determinants of public health. Also joining us today as expert discussant is Axel Marx. Axel is Deputy Director of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies at the University of Leuven since its inception in 2007. He is also involved as a lead researcher for the GLOBE Project, focusing on trade and sustainable development and new forms of governance. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation by Adam for approximately 25 minutes. Then we'll turn to Axel to kick off the discussion by offering some reflections and asking a few mm. questions, and Adam will have an opportunity to respond. Then we'll turn to questions from the audience. Feel free to send questions for the speakers at any point during the webinar by using the webinar Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. We will collect your questions to share with the speaker during the audience Q&A following the presentations. Before we begin, just a few quick words about the GLOBE project. Funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program, GLOBE seeks to understand the constraints and opportunities for the European Union in promoting its interests and values through global governance. The project aims to identify the major roadblocks to effective and coherent global governance by multiple stakeholders in a multipolar world, as well as to look ahead mm -hmm. to 2030 and 2050 in order to equip policymakers with the tools they will need to deal with future challenges. I'd also like to announce that the GLOBE project has just launched a free new massive open online course on edX. The course offers a critical introduction to the concept, importance, and analysis of global governance, and it gives special focus to the main actors involved in global governance and how these actors mm -hmm. manage current key global challenges. It's geared towards those in the field, so to speak, as well as the students, and we would be delighted to have you join us. It's free and it just launched this week. So if you're interested, I encourage you to register soon. I'm going to drop the link in the chat box for you in case you're interested. And now back to the webinar. On behalf of the GLOBE Project, I would like to thank Adam and Axel for joining us today. And it is my great pleasure to pass the floor to Adam. Mm -hmm. Pass the floor. Great. Uh, thank you, Carrie Oteburn and Axel Marks very much for um, the honor of um, having me present today. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to share my work with a, a global audience. I'm going to start off the way the book starts off. Saul Ubaldini's Ford Falcon exploded a few minutes before 2 a.m. on the morning of August 17th, 1989. Although nobody was hurt, the bomb flew the, uh, through the car several feet into the air and shattered the windows on the first floor of the main labor union confederation in Argentina, the equivalent of the AFL-CIO uh, in the United States. Um, Ubaldini was the secretary general or the leader of this labor union. Uh, when I went to Argentina in 2019, right before the beginning of the pandemic and spoke with people from the, the union, they explained to me that for us, it was the government that was responsible for this attack. I spoke also with the, the man who drove the car that night and parked it moments before it exploded. He told me 30 years later that Saul knew, and I saw it in his eyes. He knew he was going up against something big, something that wanted to shut him up. So what was Ubaldini going up against? What was, the, what was he challenging? It was a series of neoliberal economic uh, reforms, especially trade liberalization and privatization, proposed by Argentina's new president, Carlos Menem. Now, the, the threat of Ubaldini and the CGT was that in the previous democratic uh, government of Raul Alfonsín from 1983 to 1988, Ubaldini's CGT had led 13 general strikes against the similar package of neoliberal economic reforms. And so it was very clear to Menem that in order to implement his reforms, he was going to face opposition again from the CGT. Here's Saul Ubaldini uh, before uh, Alfonsín's regime, uh, actually during the military dictatorship, where Ubaldini and the CGT led the, uh, the struggle for democracy or the return of democracy in Argentina. And so the, the sides were really clear at this point when Menem uh, came into power in 1989. Uh, local Argentine newspapers explained that Menem will have to destroy the CGT as a major factor of power 
if it's going to succeed in its aim of setting out new rules for the economic game. So Menem followed through. He quickly ousted union leaders, he broke strikes with the military, and he ultimately banned a general strike in order to weaken Ubaldini and the CGT. Here's Menem, uh, and also a political cartoon uh, from 1989 in Argentina, showing one of Menem's cabinet ministers cutting Ubaldini down to size, this clear government effort to weaken labor unions. And after this wave of, of labor repression, of violation of, of workers' rights to weaken union opposition, Menem then quickly opened the Argentine economy, cutting tariffs by 40% after the threat of union opposition was overcome. Now, it wasn't just in Argentina. Halfway around the world, a similar dynamic was playing out in India. In the mid-1980s, Rajiv Gandhi, the prime minister of India, announced trade policy reforms, uh, opening up the economy uh, that triggered general strikes. So here's Rajiv Gandhi, and here's the general strikes from the mid-1980s. So this is very similar to what was going on in Argentina in the 80s, where Raul Alfonsin's reforms triggered a series of general strikes that blocked those reforms from being implemented. So we see the same thing in India in the 1980s. Right? So Gandhi, just like Alfonsin in, in, uh, in Argentina, backed down in the face of such labor opposition, allowed workers to exercise their rights to strike and protest in this way, and gave up on his trade policy reforms. Now, in the early 1990s, India's new elected prime minister, Narasim Rao proposed a similar package of reforms called the New Economic Policy, again, opening up the economy and privatizing many state-owned enterprises. Here's Narasim Rao, and just like in Argentina, uh, Rao, just like Menem, cracked down on labor opposition. And it was clear to the Indian press that this was going to be a part of the reform process. As the Hindu a mainstream Indian newspaper explained in 1992, once labor becomes seriously aroused, like they had in the 80s against um, Rajiv Gandhi's reforms, it becomes necessary to resort to repression if the reforms are not to be abandoned. Now, instead of car bombs like we saw in Argentina, Indians labor, Indian labor unions face the explosive use of, of what in India is called preventive arrests. This is the uh, common law tradition inherited from the British and, and um, embedded in the Indian constitution, which allows the government to arrest people that they expect to break the law in the future. And so what they did here was they used preventive arrests to, to limit the spread of general strikes in India. So just like the general strikes that had blocked or helped to block Rajiv Gandhi's reforms in the 1980s, Narasim Rao, when he faced general strikes against his reforms, rather than allowing workers to exercise their rights to strike in this way, he started to use preventive arrests to limit uh, the strikes. So here's a, a newspaper article from the Times of India explaining that thousands were being held in the week before the general strike. So this isn't people being arrested for breaking the law during the strike somehow, but actually detaining them before the strike to stop them from picketing during the general strike in a way that would spread the strike further. Ultimately, in 1992, 25,000 union members were arrested preventively to decrease the spread of this strike. And with strikes under control in 92 and 93, uh, through these kinds of methods, this kind of labor repression, Rao then lowered India's tariffs by more than 50%. So again, we see an instance of uh, increase in labor repression uh, facilitating the process of trade liberalization by a democratic government. So these examples illustrate broader themes. It's not just about India and Argentina, about free trade in developing countries around the world at the end of the 20th century. My new book, Opening Up by Cracking Down, tells these stories of how democratic developing countries repeatedly used labor repression to overcome labor union opposition to trade liberalization, just like we just saw in Argentina and India. Now, to be clear, a couple of definitions to get out of the way before uh, continuing the talk. Uh, democracy here uh, is roughly uh, what the polity score or even VDEM, for those of you familiar with those measures of, of political regimes, uh, have in mind. So broad suffrage, competitive elections, and basic checks on executive power. Labor repression, in contrast, is the violation of basic labor rights. You could think about the basic labor rights um, that the ILO uh, encourages countries to protect. So it's not about a violation of a law in a specific country, but rather the violation of rights that ought to exist. So even if a country uh, does not have a law that protects the right to strike, uh, that would be a violation of basic labor rights, right? So it's not a violation of domestic law, but a violation of these normative rights that workers ought to have. 
Now, importantly, this means that there are democracies that respect labor rights and those that don't. And that kind of variation uh, is key uh, to this book and the stories I'm going to tell you today. Right? Not that a democracy that represses unions ceases to be a democracy, but rather that democracies vary tremendously in their level of respect for workers' rights. So what? what's, what's the point of these stories? What are the broader implications? Although the story I have to tell, I think, is, is relatively straightforward, it's actually a critique of, of two conventional arguments in the political economy literature, both the international political economy and comparative political economy literatures. So the first uh, sort of conventional argument out there that I, that I take issue with is from international political economy. And that's the idea that democracy in developing countries or this wave of democratization at the end of the 20th century was somehow sufficient for free trade. Uh, this argument has been made by many different scholars using the predictions of the Heckscher or Lean model, which says that uh, workers in labor abundant developing countries will all benefit from free trade. And so you've got workers that sort of unanimously, or at least the overwhelming majority of them, are going to support free trade. And so democratization will empower those workers, will empower the majority to influence policy. And the argument here is that those workers will use their vote, will use the franchise to successfully demand free trade. Now, the problem with this approach, as I think will be clear as I continue the talk, uh, is one that many countries actually democratized and maintained high tariffs for quite some time. That's a puzzle, right? Democracy doesn't seem sufficient. And second, and maybe more importantly, this idea that all workers benefit from trade and support trade in developing countries sort of creates theoretical blinders where we no longer realize that there were actually lots of workers, specifically labor unions in developing countries, that really strongly and vehemently opposed free trade, right? So this idea that all workers benefit from and, and, um, and therefore support trade sort of uh, uh, leads us to ignore a uh, really important opposition from unions who again launched general strikes and protests against these reforms. The second conventional argument out there that I take issue with is this idea that democracies by definition cannot repress labor unions. And so they end up compensating uh, workers that are hurt by trade with welfare benefits like unemployment insurance or job retraining. And there's a whole laundry list of other arguments out there about how democracies manage to overcome opposition to free trade in the 1980s and 1990s. But because of this, this interesting definitional issue where they say autocracies can open up the economy and they don't have to worry about opposition because they can repress the opposition, democracies by definition can't do that, right? They're not autocracies. They can't simply repress the opposition. But that sort of leads you astray to not recognize all of the ways in which democracies actually use labor oppression, this systematic violation of workers' rights to weaken labor union opposition to trade and overcome their opposition. So the rest of the talk is gonna be broken down in the following way. First, I'm gonna uh, give a little bit more detail about my theory about you know, why I, uh, I argue that labor repression played this pivotal role in the process of trade liberalization. And then I'm gonna give a, a very brief overview of some of the evidence or the empirical evidence uh, in my book, some quantitative evidence first from 1985 to 2010, uh, actually using some of the data that Axel Marx and his colleagues uh, helped to collect. And then I'm going to give you just a, a very brief overview of some of the qualitative historical cases that I discuss in my book. Okay, so first, my theory. Um, this uh, project is broadly in what's called the open economy politics tradition in international political economy, uh, uh, a sort of uh, approach to deductive theorizing that usually has two different building blocks. One is the policy preferences of different domestic actors. And so like any uh, OEP or open economy politics uh, theory, I'm going to start off with a, a theory of policy preferences. And then second, the institutions, the domestic institutions or rules that aggregate those preferences that determine which voices <clears throat> uh, have the most influence on policy. When I talk about institutions, I'm going to talk about two different kinds of institutions. One, political regime type, right? So the difference in ideal type form between democracy and autocracy. And second, labor rights regimes. And again, an ideal type, the difference between a country that respects labor rights and one that represses labor unions or violates labor rights. Okay, so starting off with policy preferences, we want to know who wants what in terms of trade policy. Uh, in this book, I, I build on research I did in my first book, which came out in 2000. Uh, 16, which was called From Conflict to Coalition. And in this book, I argue that labor unions are more likely to share the same trade policy preferences as their employers when they have what I call profit-sharing institutions. 
So just to think about a quick example, if there's a tariff that's going to protect the steel industry, the question is whether or not steel workers, you know, workers in the steel industry, are going to join their employers to lobby in favor of high tariffs. And the, the argument in the literature for decades had been that, well, a tariff is going to increase profits for the steel industry, and it's also going to automatically increase wages. And so there's sort of a harmony of interest between workers and employers in favor of the same trade policy. But what I argue and show in this book was that there were all of these instances across space and time of workers saying, this trade policy will increase the profitability of our industry, but those profits aren't going to be shared with us in any meaningful way. Our wages will not rise along with the trade policy that increases profits in the industry. So you get a sort of uh, class like conflict, basically, in the industry, where workers and their unions say, we're not going to support this trade policy that we don't believe will actually benefit us meaningfully. With that in mind, I'm going to add this uh, sort of deductive theory of policy preferences to different kinds of industries in developing countries in the 1980s and 1990s. So starting off, we're going to think about import competing industries. Think about the steel industry in Argentina, which was not going to be able to compete with imports uh, once the economy was opened. In these industries, in developing countries during this time period, it was very, very common for these industries only to exist because of what was called ISI, Import Substitution Industrialization, a developmental strategy that included both high tariffs, but also something like profit sharing institu institutions, government support for strong labor unions in those protected industries, guaranteeing that uh, trade policy like protection that benefited the industry would also benefit workers with strong unions in those industries. So in these import competing industries, I expect capital or employers to favor protection, to, to maintain closure, to protect their industry, and also to have labor unions that are in favor of protection. These are the unions I alluded to earlier as being vehemently protectionist, uh, based on the knowledge that opening up the economy would uh, lower wages and lead to uh, hundreds of thousands of layoffs often uh, in industrial economies. Now, in export-oriented industries in developing countries in the late 20th century, it was very, very rare, if ever, do you see anything like profit-sharing institutions. The whole developmental model here is based on often maintaining low wages that stagnate or, or sort of uh, uh, do not grow as productivity and profitability increases. So in these export-oriented industries, we expect to and do often see employers or capital uh, lobby in favor of free trade. They think that uh, lowering the price of imports and increasing their ability to export will be very profitable for the industry. But labor unions own in those industries, because of the weakness of unions and the absence of profit sharing, unions are very unlikely to support free trade, which means that overall, labor unions in the country are going to be predominantly protectionist. Unions in developing countries are going to lobby against free trade, and the the even the workers in the unions and industries that where the employers might be lobbying in favor of free trade, we don't expect workers to do the same. Now, in addition to these interest groups based on their industries, we also have a general public in developing countries that past research tells us was generally favorable to trade during the 1980s and 1990s, but for various different reasons. And I, I don't sort of uh, take a side on this. I'm happy to say that there were many reasons why the general public may have supported opening the economy. There were the promise of lower consumer prices. Uh, there's research that links uh, trade openness to overall aggregate economic growth or to job creation. But there's also ideological factors. This is the period uh, of the rise of neoliberalism. Tina is a reference to, to uh, Margaret Thatcher's There Is No Alternative. This idea that in a after a lost decade debt crisis of the 1980s, slow growth and high inflation in the 80s and 90s, that many, country, that many um, people in developing countries were looking for anything else, that the old model had been discredited in their eyes and they were willing to support opening the economy. And so there's a background support from the public. And again, there's a large, large literature about these debates. Okay, now what about institutions? Under autocracy, that's the starting point in the 1980s before this wave of democratization, under autocracy in developing countries, import competing capital so like the employers or the management in the steel industry, for instance, in Argentina, dominate policy and secure trade protection, right? There, there aren't other people in the political arena. It's a small group of industrialists, basically, that are dominating policy. This is sort of the conventional wisdom uh, in, in my field of political economy. Now, democracy, if and when it came, or democratization, 
opened up the policymaking arena to new influences beyond uh, protectionist industrialists. Two of the new voices were export-oriented capital, which we just discussed are going to favor free trade, and also the broader demands of the public in favor of trade liberalization, right? So democratization then opens up policymaking to these new voices that are going to push towards trade openness, right? And this is part of the story that's common about democracy leading to trade liberalization in developing countries, new voices that wanted free trade. But democracy also opens up the policymaking arena to labor unions. And as we just discussed in uh, the slides about uh, policy preferences, unions in developing countries demanded protection, right? They represented workers in these import competing industries where they knew that opening up uh, would lower their wages and lead to massive layoffs. Now the balancing here of whether or not labor unions can counterbalance export oriented capital and the general public depends on the level of respect for labor rights. Right? The more workers' rights are protected, the more these protectionist unions can counterbalance the demands for free trade from export-oriented capital and the general public. Now, all of this boils down to some pretty simple predictions. Right? There's all these little micro foundations and moving pieces, but it all boils down to the following. Democracy with labor rights is expected to lead to trade protection or the maintenance of high tariffs. And it's only democracy with labor repression that weakens unions and, and enables the government to overcome their opposition that we'd expect to see trade liberalization, right? So democracy and labor repression combined to facilitate the process of trade opening. Democracy had the potential to lead to trade liberalization because it empowered these new voices in favor of free trade, but it was only when repression weakened the labor unions that pushed back against it that we actually got the implementation of trade liberalization. Now you could combine democracy and free trade in two different ways. And I think that this means that there are two different paths theoretically and then again, historically that I see play out in de democratic developing countries. Path one <clears throat> is labor repression first, then democracy. The sequencing here you can think of as uh, a transition to democracy from an autocracy that repressed labor unions, right? So you have labor repression first and a labor repressive autocracy. It's a struggle for democracy, a transition to democracy, but you continue the labor repression from the past, right? So it's a new democracy, but it continues repressing labor unions and opens up quite quickly because labor unions are not able to stop the uh, reform process. Now, the second path is democracy first. So this would be a transition to democracy away from autocracy, but a democracy that respects workers' rights. In that situation, we don't expect to see trade liberalization right away, right? A democracy that respects workers' rights, like India in the 1980s, like Argentina in the 1980s, we spoke about earlier, there we expect general strikes and protests from unions to block or to help block trade liberalization. So if you get democracy first with respect for labor rights, it's only till you la add labor repression later on, whether it's two years, five years, or 40 years later, it's an increase in labor repression in an established democracy that's the second pathway towards free trade. I'm gonna show you some quick quantitative evidence that's supportive of these claims, by, by, by no means definitive, but certainly supportive of my argument from 1985 to 2010. Now in the background here, uh, everybody knows uh, that the number of uh, democratic countries in the developing world uh, increased dramatically during this period of the late 20th and early 21st century. And also the tariffs fell tremendously during this period as well, especially in developing countries. Right? So this is the sort of background uh, by which um, people have argued that it was something about the increase in democracy or democratization that led to the decline in tariffs. But it really matters. It really depends on the level of respect for labor rights. So here what we see is the change in tariffs over time in all of the countries in, in my data set that transitioned to democracy during the study period from 85 to 2010. What we see here is that before democratization, that's on the left side of this plot, we see very little change in tariff levels the four years before democratization. And then after the transition to democracy, we see two different trajectories. That solid black line are the countries that transition to democracy and have relatively high respect for workers' rights. And the dotted line are the countries that transition to democracy and have low level of respect for labor rights or, or high levels of labor repression. 
And we see dramatically different trajectories, right? The countries that respected workers' rights liberalize only a little bit following democratization, whereas the countries that repress labor unions see much uh, greater reductions in tariffs. Just to sort of um, give you some descriptive statistics, following democratization, countries that repressed unions lowered tariffs 3.25 times more than those that respected labor rights. That's the difference roughly between those that solid black line and the dotted line. Now, a little more systematic study of this uh, can be done with regression analysis, um, cross-national uh, regression analysis, looking at the interaction between the level of democracy and the level of respect for labor rights and, and how that explains variation in tariff levels over time. The data comes from sort of obvious places, the World Bank, uh, Polity, UDS, and also the VDEM score, and labor rights, as I mentioned before, from Lena Mosley, but also from Axel Marx and, and, and colleagues of, of yours there in Belgium. And a whole bunch of different controls and model techniques that I, that I won't get into. What I do want to show you briefly are these marginal effects plots. So the y-axis here is the association between democracy and tariffs. And on the x-axis, axis, we have level of respect for labor rights. What we see here is that at low levels of respect for labor rights, that is when there's high levels of repression, there's a negative relationship between democracy and tariffs. Right? That's that conventional wisdom. An increase in democracy should lead to a decrease in tariffs. And we see that that's the case, but only where respect for labor rights is really low. Right? Put differently, democracy or transition to democracy or an increase in democracy is only associated with trade liberalization when there's high levels of labor repression. That's what I called path one earlier. Now, path two, you can see here. Here on the x-axis, we have the level of democracy measured by the polity score. And so over there on the right side of the plot, those are, are countries that are, are stable democracies that have high levels of democracy. And on the y-axis, we have the effect of labor rights on tariffs. And so what we see here is there's a positive association between respect for workers' rights and tariffs. Now, the inverse of that is that a decrease in labor rights, an increase in repression, is associated with a decrease in tariffs. And so what we're seeing here is evidence in favor of path two, that in a stable democracy, an increase in repression is associated with a decrease in tariffs. Now, these general associations in the data tell us that there's something to the story, but it sort of lacks a, a more detailed understanding of the mechanisms that are really linking it, right? Is it really labor repression systematically overcoming union opposition, or is it just a coincidence in the data? I'll tell you very, very briefly about some of the labor history, the case studies that I, I talk about in the book, in just the last couple of minutes. So the, uh, the book presents a series of cross-case and within-case comparisons of trade policy reform in Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, India, and Turkey. And I use these cases to illustrate these two different pathways. Mexico transitions to democracy with low levels of respect for labor rights, and that transition to democracy is associated with relatively rapid trade liberalization. Argentina and India we spoke about earlier, these are periods where a stable democracy tries to reform, but because of its respect for labor rights, general strikes and worker protests are able to stop uh, those trade policy reforms to maintain protection. It's only in a subsequent period where countries where the democratic government increases labor repression systematically to overcome those general strikes and protests that we actually see trade liberalization. We see a similar dynamic in Bolivia in the 1980s. Last, I talk about Turkey in the book, which is a very interesting case. Uh, because there's this sort of intervening period of three years of a military dictatorship uh, that basically wipes out the labor union movement in Turkey. And so when democracy returns to Turkey in 1983, uh, labor union leaders are still in prison, and that new democratic government implements trade liberalization very, very quickly without any meaningful labor union opposition because of the high levels of repression continued from the military dictatorship. So I, I don't have time to go into any more detail about what I think are the, the rich uh, stories that I tell in, in the book. So I'll just conclude by, by saying that opening up by cracking down presents a, re a revisionist account, both in a theoretical and an empirical sense of the process through which many developing countries embrace free trade. And specifically, democratic developing countries often used labor repression to overcome union opposition to trade liberalization. And I hope I've uh, piqued your interest enough to take a look at the, the book in more detail. And I look forward to a discussion with Carrie Oteburn and Axel Marx, as well as answering any questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Adam, uh, for this really interesting presentation. I wish we had a little more time to hear some of those stories, but
I encourage everyone to get a hold of the book. Um, maybe you can read it over Christmas uh, break or something. Um, I'm going to just remind the audience really quickly that you can send your questions to me through the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. And now we'll pass the floor over to Axel to kick off today's discussion. Axel, we turn to you. Thank you very much, Carrie, And thank you very much, Adam, for a wonderful presentation on a wonderful book. I would first of all like to congratulate Adam on a very important book, I think, and I want to add to the praise the book already received by many eminent scholars. It's a powerful book on trade liberalization and how democratic de developing countries engage in labor repression to open up their economies to compete in a global economy. And it adds to this debate about a race to the bottom, race to the top of trade liberalization in relation to uh, environmental protection, labor rights protection, and, and so on. In an effort to pursue export-led economic growth and industrial development, democratic governments constrains and silence labor unions in an effort to reduce labor costs to become more competitive. And I think especially the case studies in the book by Adam uh, make uh, that come to a life very, very much. It's also a wonderful combination of theory and empirical investigation. Adam nicely outlined the, the different theoretical debates we have engaged with, and he combines very interestingly quantitative and qualitative analysis and different types of data to make a very convincing argument and, and, and narrative. And both through within cases, which are very uh, interesting, but also cross-case analysis issues, outlined these two pathways which he identified and on how democratic developing countries use labor repression to overcome union opposition and thereby facilitate the process of trade liberalization, which he nicely explained in, in the webinar. I also, I want to comment very much on the very well-written uh, style of the book. It's really well-written and the opening sentence, which Adam also showed at the beginning of the webinar, uh, reminded me of the opening of the book Leviathan by uh, Paul Auster. He is a, Paul Auster is quite a famous American novelist. And in both books, an explosion starts the story. Uh, uh, somebody uh, and a car explodes and it really grips you and you want to know more. And uh, of course, Paul Auster is a novelist and that's the trick they sometimes apply to get you in a book. But in the case of Adam, these types of Examples are really very relevant and interesting to get a gripping description of real life events. And what we are talking about when we talk about all the dynamics, mechanisms, and so on, which are behind the theory and the data, and it really uh, illustrates very well the points in the book. And in, in essence, maybe that's my reading, and Edward can correct me if he doesn't agree, but the book sketches quite a sobering pi a picture about the relationship between democracy, trade liberalization, and union repression. And the book places really union repression at the heart of international trade in democratic de developing countries and the many struggles. Uh, I think civil society actors, union leaders, and so on confront every day um, uh, in their day to day work. And in this way, it actually adds to the argument of a, a possible race to the bottom. Uh, of labor rights protection in the context of economic globalization and, and trade globalization. And I think the book has quite an important, I think, policy implications, or at least to reflect on them, and especially in the current debates on trade globalization and labor rights protection. So I will focus my questions mostly on <clears throat> possible implications, and we can maybe also hear from the audience some of the, the, the thoughts they might have or questions they might have with regard to that. But before going into the questions on the policy implications, I had a question if you maybe have something to say, you can give all your thoughts about uh, the relationship between trade liberalization and political regime and repression, but maybe from a different angle and set of countries. Uh, you highlighted very nicely also in the webinar this uh, with the arrow, how democracy and labor repression leads to trade liberalization. And that's, of course, the argument uh, uh, you make. But maybe looking a bit at the other way around, can you say a few things about the possible effects of trade liberalization on a political regime? 
And with this, I mean, you have cases where you have authoritarian regimes which open up for trade and that possibly influences uh, uh, the political regime as such and which actually might empower civil society actors. And there's a clearly a mechanism by which opening up to trade does not lead to political change. And we know the very well like, known example of China joining the World Trade Organization and the anticipation which was related to that. But maybe you see some other mechanisms, dynamics in other countries and we'll be very interested <clears throat> to hear if you have any thoughts on, on, on that. Then on the policy implications. Um, this is all about the nexus between trade liberalization and labor rights protection. And that plays out in on the multilateral level. Uh, we are in a global governance webinar, but there are many uh, multilateral uh, 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 dimensions to this. And I come back to that in my last question with regard to the international labor organization, but also bilaterally. I think there's now an increasing recognition that trade liberalization does affect labor rights and that this should be addressed. And this becomes very evident when we look at different trade instruments, such as free trade agreements, which now increasingly include what we call non-trade objectives, uh, such as the protection of labor rights. Now, the Biden administration ha now has this worker-centered trade policy, which reflects the commitment to use trade agreements and tools to empower workers. And they developed a narrative with regard to possibly empowering of workers uh, in the context, of course, domestically in the United States, but also uh, uh, abroad. And that they really want to have more a global race to the, let's say not top, but really a global race to stronger protect uh, labor rights. Here in Europe, the European Union has since 2011 been included quite strong provisions on labor rights protection in, in their trade agreements. Uh, but that has proven so far to be, let's say, debatable in terms of, of, of effects and is now really considering of strengthening their approach. Uh, and that implies uh, increased monitoring, increased protection of freedom of association and collective bargaining, possibly the use of, of, of sanctions. And these are typically uh, EU, US countries who make trade agreements with countries like India, Argentina, and so on. So I would very much like to hear in light of your, your findings, what you make of all these efforts. Uh, when, <laughs> when I read your book, I, I had a bit of the impression like it was roaring against the tide. So in these agreements, you stipulate a few commitments, but the overall tide is really uh, an eroding of protection of labor rights, even if you would include it in an agreement. But I would be very, uh, very curious to hear uh, uh, your, your thoughts on that. Second, also related to these approaches of trying to uh, link or trying to protect uh, labor rights uh, protection to trade agreements. Um, there's, of course, an important role to be played by companies where labor rights violations and non-compliances occur. And in this context, there's a very, I think, interesting innovation in the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, the successor of NAFTA, where they introduced this rapid response mechanism specifically to address and target companies who are in violation of protection of freedom of association and collecting. <clears throat> and I was wondering in your assessment and in your reading of all of this, can this type of instrument influence the mechanisms you describe and prevent labor repression? And, and is it maybe one way, way forward? And I would very much hear your, your thoughts about that. And then finally, as I said in the beginning, there's a multilateral dimension. There's a global governance dimension to this. And for many uh, decades, of course, the ILO has been putting out conventions, declaration on fundamental principles and rights at work and, and, and so on. But if you would be able now to advise the International Labour Organization in light of your findings, what would you advise them based on your research? What would be their main recommendations in terms of what they need to address to really make sure um, that these rights are protected? Because as you rightly pointed out in the, in, in the webinar, uh, uh, these 
rights you look at are not necessarily uh, already embedded in domestic law, but of course the ILO Declaration of Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work um, um, points out that all members of the ILO should strive to uh, uh, ratify and implement the conventions which are included in the Fundamental Declaration. And of course, the conventions on freedom of association and, and, and collective bargaining are a very important part of, of, of the declaration. And so there's at least a moral obligation by the, the ILO members to, to, to act on it. So I would really be interested in what you would advise the ILO. So thank you, Adam, and back over to you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your deep engagement with the, the book and, and your very flattering uh, words. Uh, my, my father does a lot of creative writing, and uh, he also likes the opening line. Uh, so it was very, very meaningful for me to hear that you that you like that. It's a very flattering comparison too to that that novel. Um, there's a lot to, to cover. I don't, I don't think I'll be able to do all of your questions justice. Um, I'll start off by saying uh, as, as you noted, the, the sort of broader, uh, you know, what are the broader implications of, of, of the argument? Um, I'll say, uh, first, on one level, um, uh, it's a revisionist account. And, and the goal is to basically say that, like, you know, it's not, we don't live in the end of history, this sort of like neoliberal fairy tale that democracy and free trade and the alleviation of poverty and like all good things automatically go together. Um, you know, what was and is a, a fairy tale, that there's a dark side to globalization that's been uh, really systematically ignored and left out of our understanding of it, the things we write about, the things we teach our students. And so my real goal is just to sort of set the record straight uh, empirically and, and theoretically about, about what happened. Um, mo moving forward, it also raises, I think, difficult questions. Once we um, put aside, I think, this myth that all good things go together, to the extent that trade liberalization required, and maybe required is too strong of a word, but to the extent that democratic countries very often use labor repression, whether it was required or not, very often repress labor unions uh, in order to open the economy, there's a sort of like a two punch um, effect on labor unions. The first is this political decision to, to repress them, to limit their rights to act collectively. And that, that um, delegitimizes unions, it weakens their ability to act, um, and ends up lowering union density uh, and making them a, an illegitimate actor in, in domestic politics as, as the state is repressing them. And then obviously by weakening them, it enables the country to open up. Uh, so after that political logic, there's then this economic logic that Axel uh, referred to it, and many people are familiar with that uh, openness to the global economy puts downward competitive pressure, the sort of race to the bottom downward pressure on wages and working conditions in developing countries. So that also happens, but it's these two together that means that democratic developing countries first made the political decision to weaken unions and then basically unleashed global market forces that weaken them further. So this really means that free trade uh, comes at the consequence of the weakening of the labor movement, which I think you know many people have pointed out before. But, but as we go back then to the relationship between democracy and trade, uh, and, and development, we get a much more potentially nefarious relationship where democratic countries, democratic governments, uh, made these decisions to repress unions and open the economy in a way that weakens unions and therefore potentially erodes the sustainability of democracy itself. So rather than democracy leading to free trade, and then this is just basically like the end of history, we have a, a much more cyclical process where democracies repress unions to open the economy then that then potentially unwinding the, the process of democratization itself. Unions played an active role uh, in the struggle for democracy in many countries, and even where they didn't lead the struggle, have been a, a major actor in the sustaining uh, of democracy. And so the weakening of unions uh, by many other scholars has, has been pointed out to be uh, an enabling condition for the erosion of democracy around the world. So I, I you know, I have a much more um, you know, whether to say optimistic or pessimistic, I think a much more realistic view of, of this process. Um, so that's where I'll start off with the broader implications. Uh, in terms of the USMCA, the NAFTA 2.0 that was renegotiated uh, and, and their linking of trade and labor, I'm, I'm really happy you asked me about this. I live here 
in Washington, D.C. My office at GW is just a few blocks from the U.S. Trade Representative's office. And I had the chance to meet with uh, somebody from the USTR's office recently to talk about the rapid response uh, program enabled by USMCA and their extreme excitement about their, their newfound ability to enforce labor rights in Mexico. Um, so, you know, I'll basically say to you and, and the audience what I said to um, this person at the US, at USTR, which is basically that, you know, this new book that I wrote, I think fits in very nicely as like historical and theoretical background for why what they're doing is so important, right? That the relationship between uh, democracy, trade, and, and workers' rights is not this sort of like uplifting, all good things story, you know, all the good things go together story, but, but rather there's like reasons to be deeply skeptical about the relationship between democracy and free trade on the one hand and the, the rights of workers and the uplift of workers on the other. So I think stepping in this way uh, with uh, new policies that actually enable the US, Canada, and the Mexican government to work together to increase union democracy and independent unions in Mexico that uh, will actually fight for higher wages and better working conditions for workers uh, marks, a, a, you know, I think a real sea change, uh, at least uh, in the ability of the US government to do this. They've tried since NAFTA uh, in some sense, NAFTA and CAFTA and other bilateral trade agreements, but these agreements have always been toothless. Um, the USTR will be happy to tell you that they filed, uh, you know, a case against Guatemala under CAFTA, and it went on, I think, for eight years, and ultimately was lost, uh, and there was no 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 changes made in Guatemala. Uh, but in just like a short period of time since the USMCA and the rapid response has gone into effect, they've already successfully um, filed in one, I think, more than six cases already. Uh, so you know, it's still not you know hundreds or thousands, but it's it's a start and it's a a very meaningful difference. Um, so I think my book just sort of adds ammunition to the changes that we're seeing in American trade policy uh, today. Um, your last question about, about the ILO, um, what I would advise uh, to the ILO, I, I guess it's just similar to what I've been saying, that the relationship between labor rights and trade is not just what happens after opening the economy, which I think is where a lot of the focus is. You know, how is trade going to impact workers' uh, rights over time moving forward? But that there's like a like an earlier stage uh, of politics there, where democratic governments were stepping in to repress unions in order to implement those reforms in the first place. So maybe just a, a shifting of the gaze of, of when uh, attention is needed to, to labor rights. Is it after the economy is opened, or is it during that initial process of opening itself? I, I do see questions in the Q and A. Should yeah. I respond? Thank you very much, Adam. No, we'll, we'll handle this. Uh, oh. <laughs> no worries. Um, thank you, thank you so much, um, Adam and Axel. Did you want to respond to any of these points, or? Yeah, I just want to, if I have one minute, just to come back to what Adam said about this relationship between uh, labor repression and how democracies evolve over time. Because at the, at the current time, we of course also have a lot of discussions and some empirical evidence already of what we call democratic backsliding, especially in countries like India, there have been concerns, but also in, in, in other countries. And I thought it was very interesting that you remarked about how you can have this, let's say, uh, dynamic between, on the one hand, labor repression, how that then, of course, weakens civil society, maybe to spillover effects in other organizations, then that then, of course, uh, weakens um, democracy as a whole. And I think that's more maybe for, for future research, but definitely looking at the trends over time in labor repression and how that <clears throat> reflects in trends over time with regard to democracy is a very interesting point. Yeah, there's um, uh, there's a great book, a classic book that I actually I have here because I was just working on this capitalist development and democracy by Rushmeyer, Stevens and Stevens from 1992. Uh, we, you know, where they argue that the uh, the rise of democracy in, in Latin America in particular uh, was really linked to uh, basically ISI, so high tariffs and industrialization in Latin America, which gave rise to a uh, highly unionized industrial workforce. And those unions were a major part of the, the struggle for and the sustaining of democracy. Right? So you have trade protection 
leading to the rise of strong unions and democracy. And I think my book pairs well, and that's what I was writing about uh, recently for a 30 year anniversary celebration of that, of that book, that my book sort of, um, you know, lays out what might be the unwinding of that process. So democratic countries deciding to, to undermine and weaken those labor unions that originally fought for democracy uh, in order to dismantle the trade policies that had fostered those industries in the first place. And maybe it should not be surprising to us then that in unwinding that process, we might also be undermining the sustainability of democracy itself. Yeah, thank you very much. Gary? Thank you. Uh, thank you for this debate. We have a few questions in from the audience, and so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in since we don't have a lot of time. I'll start with three questions and we'll see if we have time for more. All right, so first we have a question from Bacha Kabede Debella. Apologies if I don't get the name quite right who is wondering if you can reflect on the role of national political ideology and political administrative contexts in the countries that you studied, as well as international actors and the implications for these, um, for democracy and labor rights and your arguments. And also, can you comment on if there's any role that you saw for multinational corporations in, this, in these processes? And then uh, finally, um, we have a question uh, regarding, I'm wondering how the situation evolves. Does labor repression uh, lessen over time after the liberalization process, or does it have to be maintained? And obviously, some of these democracies have already had uneasy relationships with labor rights. Um, do you see changes as trade policy changes over time? And since the since the 90s, 80s and 90s, where this all first took place, we'll start with those. Yeah, these are fantastic questions. Uh, the role of of political ideology. Um, so, so I mentioned that I, I see ideology as, as one of the, the sort of neoliberal ideology that's really um, becoming hegemonic in the 1980s and 1990s around the world as, as a, a sort of compelling argument for why there was uh, somewhat broad support for trade liberalization in many democratic developing countries during this period. You know, part of it can be linked to the, the a response to economic crisis in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but again, this is the period of, of there is no alternative, and there's this sort of feedback uh, between political leaders uh, that have decided to implement these reforms or to try to implement these reforms, uh, and the, the rhetoric they use to explain these policies. Certainly, Menem um, painted the labor unions as backward, backward-looking, um, from a, a part of Argentine world history that, that was impossible to return to that the present and future required uh, neoliberal economic reform. Um, some people see that as like the rational policy to, to implement, and other people see that as the product of ideology. Um, I think it's probably a little bit of both. Certainly the rhetoric that Menem used uh, was, was very ideological, and the unions fought back in, in a sort of broader ideological discourse, arguing that like, uh, like what it really meant to be a democracy uh, was to have strong labor unions in this sort of like strong protected domestic market. Um, and that it was uh, Menem that actually wanted to go back, wanted to move backward to a period before Juan Perón when there were no labor rights in Argentina. And so there's a sort of ideological struggle of who, who's backward, the, the, the liberals or the, or the protectionists uh, or the sort of social democratic unions here. Um, that's a great, a great question. Um, as, as I think is probably obvious uh, from the from the talk, you know, I, I'm sort of uh, like a historical materialist of sorts. I see this as a sort of like battle of economic interests. Um, and so uh, while I acknowledge the role of ideology, it's not it's not my main focus in this book or or my broader work, but I'm happy to, you know, to acknowledge that it, it certainly matters and plays a big role in the story. Um, the role of multinational corporations. Um, I think I'll just say quickly that a lot of the export-oriented industries uh, that lobbied for free trade in the 80s and 90s following democratization were often uh, linked up with multinational corporations. So not, not in the sense of like, you know, I don't know um, what, um, uh, what Nick Wolf ha has in mind, but uh, like certainly uh, uh, globally uh, oriented companies in Turkey and Mexico are, are linked with companies abroad, often in the United States, and that there's uh, lobbying from those uh, conglomerates and firms 
uh, in favor of, of trade. So I, I definitely see a role for them there. They're not just domestic capital. And then the the last question is it from Carrie? Is it from Azmi uh, Kiz, Kizniski? This one. I'm not seeing. No, I'll repeat it. It came in through a, the chat instead. Um, it is. Let me just get to it. Um, do you have a sense for how the situation evolves um, after after these this initial labor rep repression um, during these times of liberalization? So after, since this 80s, 90s period, um, does the labor repression lessen over time? Does it have to be maintained? I see. That's a great question. Um, I would say that it does not have to be maintained. Uh, often, often there's a secular decline in labor rights in, the, in these countries. And I think that that might be the sort of economic logic I alluded to before, right? That once the economy is open, these sort of well-known uh, economic logics kick in of downward pressure on wages and working conditions and, and workers' rights. But but the repression that I really focus on um, is, is sort of sh uh, short-lasting and highly strategic. I didn't get a chance to talk about any of the cases in too much depth, uh, but I go to great pains in the book to show like how conscious uh, these democratic leaders were, especially in Argentina and India. Uh, it wasn't just like labor oppression here and there. It wasn't like breaking a union to lower wages, to increase comp competitiveness. It was leaders that were very, very clearly thinking about what happened to their predecessors in the 1980s when they tried to open up the economy and general strikes and protests from unions blocked those reforms. And they, and they very systematically over the course of, of you know one two three years so a relatively short period of time, basically uh, systematically um, dismantled and weakened union opposition through like um, you know very um, careful I wouldn't say surgical but very like careful interventions and I, I'd encourage you to, to read the chapter on Argentina uh, where I detail the story of Menem like slowly peeling off unions from that Ubaldini coalition that was opposing his reforms through different measures like banning uh, outlawing strikes, decertifying specific unions that were aligned with this Ubaldini opposition coalition, uh, ultimately breaking the strike, breaking a strike with the military. And all of this is like very clearly linked to Menem's fear of a general strike that could block his reforms the way that the 13 general strikes had blocked his predecessor's reforms. Um, so after, after that opposition is basically weakened and overcome and the, the policies are implemented, then you know, we don't see that kind of continuation specifically targeted to the dynamic that I'm interested in. But I don't want to suggest that it's like a return to some utopian social democracy with high levels of respect for labor rights. It's just that these targeted um, violations are basically, uh, they accomplish their goal and then we see them sort of stop. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for these answers. I hope uh, the audience found them um, satisfactory. Uh, I think that is unfortunately all the time we have today. So we're not going to have time to go into any of the other questions that we have. But I would really like to once again uh, thank our guests, Adam Dean and Axel Marx, for taking part in this discussion and also to all of you in the audience today for taking part in this webinar. Um, before leaving you, and especially for those who join on a regular basis, I wanted to inform you that the GLOBE project is actually coming to an end this month after four years, and that this is in fact the final GLOBE webinar in the GLOBE webinar series on the future of global governance. But don't fear, we'll be back in early 2023 with a new series that will continue to feature cutting edge research and books uh, and topics quite related to global governance. And you can look out for that series at the Leuven Center for Global Governance website. Uh, you can just search for that online and you should find it. And you can still watch all the old episodes on the GLOBE website at globe-project.eu, which will remain available for the foreseeable future. So thank you all again for joining us today and for making this webinar series a wonderful platform over the past three years. Do stay tuned via the Lumen Center for Global Governance Studies website, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. From all of us at the GLOBE Project, thank you and farewell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Bye-bye. Thank you all very much.